All right. Hi, guys. Matt Lemke here with your Gamer Goggles. Gamer-goggles.com. I've got a new baby. Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Is it a good baby or a bad baby? I don't know yet. So let's go do the flip through. We'll come back and I'll talk about whether or not I like the Tome of Foes for D&D 5th Ed. <laughs> Alright, we're back. Switched positions. And, whoa, look at that. Black pages. I should wish, wish I had my silver marker. Anyway, so, the very first thing we see is, well, obviously the credits and the disclaimer and all that fun stuff. That's not really all that fun. Uh, is the table of contents. And one of the first things that I noticed about this book is there is about 115 pages of lore. Which, in a monster manual, bestiary style book, is rather unique. Uh, at least in my experience, I haven't seen too many books that do anything like that. And then you have roughly, let's see, 100, 140 pages of monsters. Now, uh, you turn the page and you see the preface, which basically lets you know that Mordekainen is a high-level wizard, well, powerful wizard, experienced wizard in uh, the world of Greyhawk, and that uh, Big B is his apprentice, and Big B is writing writing this book. This is not actually a book from uh, Mordenkainen. Now, the other thing that's really kind of unique is they just put the perspectives uh, of Mordenkainen into the book, which you don't really need, but if you're a GM who really enjoys the story and the life of Dungeons & Dragons, uh, it, there's a lot of flavor in them. Um, and sometimes they're really cool, like, I don't remember which monster it was, and maybe we'll come back to it. I don't want to spend a lot of time looking for it. Uh, it was early on, actually. So let's go to about 115. Real quick, turn a few pages. Is it this guy? No. Uh, well, maybe we'll find it later. But I'm not seeing it. So we'll come back. And I probably already went too far. But anyway, and then it tells you a little bit more about the book and what to expect and how to use it. We'll zoom in just a little bit more and I'll move the book around. Uh, so the very first chapter is the Blood War, which is the war between demons and devils, which in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, for as long as I can remember, demons and devils have been at war. And this talks about how one force is now always the two forces are always in a constant struggle to uh, outdo the other. Um, and a real brief note here: this is actually my favorite picture of the book. I do not know why. I cannot tell you why, but there is just something about that picture that stands out to me as being the best picture of the book. Um, what else is notable about the first chapter? Uh, demon oh, yeah, yeah, you're right there. Boom. You have the demonic point of view, which really is something that I felt uh, hasn't necessarily been missing, but hasn't been put into one place and summarized like this. And, of course, if you have the demonic point of view, you have the devilish point of view, or the devil's point of view a few chapters later. Uh, and this goes through um, all the different demons and devils and... Uh, the conflict, it talks about the different conflicts and rank and file of the different things. But one of the things that it adds is diabolical cults. So if you wanted to play a heavy cult type of adventure slash campaign, you find some of the tools to do that with right here. And then uh, you can create your own devils, which is a, kind of a, a fun thing to do. Uh, now, it's, it's important to note that, like I said, devils and demons are a little bit different. Uh, I would say that uh, devils lead to be, a little, to be a little bit more noble and honorable. Well, actually, they're very honorable. If you sign a contract with the devil, they're going to honor it, which is one of the things I was looking for with the, the other creature. 
Um, and then there's they talk about demonic boons, which is when the chaos of hundreds of thousands of demons boon forth uh, and attack. Uh, so, and then uh, you have uh, cambions, which is basically demonic cults. Uh, the different traits of them, uh, of uh, demons, and how to customize them, the, the bonds, and so forth. Um, if I sound a little bit stuffy, I'm sorry. I have uh, heavy allergies this year. Uh, now, I guess a little bit more about the personality of Mordecai and why he discusses these things. No, actually, I'll come back to that in a, a couple minutes. So chapter 2 is heavily, heavily about elves and the drow, or the drow, depending on how you wish to say it. Uh, and there is a lot of um, information here on playing elves. Uh, if you've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for a long time, uh, you might not need a lot of this. You might it might be just you know stuff that's been printed over the different editions. But for fifth edition, it's all pretty much in one place now. Uh, there's a lot in here about the different conflicts, uh, the deities, elves' relationships with magic, and things of that nature. And we're gonna speed up a little bit because uh, my goal is like about 10 minutes and I'm already over half that. Uh, there's a big chapter on Loth here, or section of the chapter on Loth. Uh, one of the important things to note about all of these lore chapters from here on out is there's a lot of information on the different sub-races. Uh, different things about the sea elves, different uh, tables for trinkets and traits and things of that nature. In chapter three, we get into the dwarves and the Durgar. And again, it, it follows the same pattern of the elves, deities, traits, again, charts of the things. Uh, again, this information is information that is put together in a 5th edition sort of way and put in front of you all in one place for if you're a Dwarven player or a GM who wants to run a Dwarven campaign. This is really good stuff. Uh, and here's uh, dwarves in the clan, different statuses of the clan, and then there's special Durgar tables. Uh, and then chapter four is the Gith and they're in this war, which is basically the Gith and the Githanki were slaves to the Mind Slayers, Mind Slayers, Mind Flayers, uh, and how they evolved to become two different species. Uh, there's a lot here. It's really cool that it's all in one spot. I think many times I had to, when I wanted to find this information uh, in pre playing previous editions, I needed to go into several different books. There's a great picture of one of the Gith swords. It's a silver sword. Flying ships. <laughs> uh, and after you, you know, you get through the basic history, you start with the Gith sword. Githzetherai, I've never been able to say their name, uh, and then uh, you have the different Gith tables, you've got Githinky names, and how to, to randomly just roll them up for, for NPCs or whatever, uh, Different the different bonds, like for example, the first bond, you roll D4, there's no greater duty than to serve the Revered Queen. Um, and then chapter 5, this is actually you know, one of the, the most unique chapters of the book, and that's because the Havelings and Gnomes really weren't in any conflict. Uh, and Mordekainen, more than anything, his worldview is about, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use the alignment, neutrality, uh, balance. Everything he does is to bring things back into balance. He is probably, uh, I don't, I, I've never played him, I've never seen him in any books, so, but from from what this book is portraying him as, he is probably the essence of all that is true neutral. Uh, or tries to be, I should say, because that is extremely difficult. Um, and he dabbles in all these different things to bring balance and order or balance back into Spectrum in the universe or the Megaverse or uh, all of Dungeons and Dragons. But halflings and gnomes are in here. Uh, because he genuinely just wanted to study them, and he talks about their their demeanors, 
uh, in great detail. It talks again about halfling deities. Uh, it gives you the different charts for character creation, like personality traits and tables. And the same thing with gnomes. It talks about how gnomes are uh, very industrious. They're always active. They do not want to waste any of their time. They're continually working towards building and developing things. Uh, tinkering, so to speak. And then we hit the bestiary. Or bestiary, depending on your thought patterns. And we're just going to kind of flip through here. Uh, there's a, there's quite a bit of new material in here. Now, there is some material that has been repeated. I know that... Uh, oh, shoot. The name is slipping my tongue. Um, some of this material repeats from... I want to say Out of the Abyss. Uh, as you get to the Devils and Demons. Probably like 15 or 16 pages. Some of the other stuff... Actually, here's, here's one of the cooler creatures... In my opinion, is the cadaver collector. Uh, they introduce or introduce add some more clockworks, uh, death locks, and then you have your demons. Uh, and some of this stuff, like you can just tell, has been lifted from other books. But why do I think that's okay in this book? I think that's okay in this book. There's a great picture. I think it's okay in this book because. You have this book about Mordekainen's Tome of Foes, and he talks specifically about the Blood War. And this monster manual reflects heavily the things that he has discovered in his journeys as a wizard. So it's okay because it fits the flair, and you might not have that book. Um, and I think that's okay too because there are GMs and DMs that don't want to buy. Uh, sandbox adventure types of books to get their creatures because they're not going to play the adventure uh, so this is another way that you can get it i would say probably it's 115 pages ish 140 pages -ish of of monsters probably close to 80 to 90 percent of it is all unique you do get into uh the darrow uh, which are kind of neat and then after that you get into well there's more devils uh, some of those are probably lifted from other books. And then uh, what they do spend a lot of time on, if I can find it, is the uh, Drow and the Durger. A good bit of time. So you have the Drow Arachnomancer uh, and you have the Drow Favorite Consort, which are basically the special guards of the Drow Matron, who is a CR uh, 21, I think she was. Where is it? She's up there. She's quite powerful. She's crazy, actually. Um, challenge rating only of 20. I thought she was 21, but she's a 20. Uh, but she's not somebody you want to fight. Uh, she also has uh, the Drow Shadow Blades here. These are like crazy uh, people of the Noble House. Not, not crazy as insane, just they're a little bit nutty because challenge rating of 11 is is again getting up there a little bit. We have and then we, then we get into the Durgar I was talking about. Actually, that Durgar is pretty uh, crazy looking. He's a mind master. He's only a challenge rating two, but I don't know if I was a first level PC or a second level PC, I would not want to see him. <laughs> he just he looks like some undead vampire. I kind of like this guy. The stone guard. He looks a little bit stony. His hair looks like stone. He looks like he can impale you like a rhino. And then we have... Oh, we have the Adelons. The Ladrons. Oh, 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 oh. We have the Phoenix. So there's a lot of cool stuff. Um... Myrmidons, they've got the fire elemental uh, of uh, this one is challenge rating 7 these are all challenge rating 7s, the water elemental that is actually one of my favorite pictures along with the earth elemental in the book uh, you have the Gethanki supreme commander which is that guy and then you have the Gish and you have the Kithra which 
is all really pretty amazing when you take it into account that uh, the next few pages are about the Githanki Howlers. They made a, a resurgence again in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but you get the idea. Lots of creatures, mostly, I'd say close to 50% of the book is tending up. Shadow Dancers. They're kind of cool. Soulmongers, Skulks. Some uh, great artwork in the back here. And then, skipping to the back back. Back back. Ha <laughs> ha You start with doo -doo -doo, the appendixes, or appendix I. I'm not sure which is actually correct. First one is stat blocks uh, by creature type. And then you have challenge rating, which lists all the challenge ratings. You have one eighth all the way up to, I think, challenge rating 26. Um, and actually, one of the largest challenge rating groups is two, followed probably by 10. Uh, and then you have creatures by environment, which can be fun if you're uh, paying attention to that in your campaigns. I kind of tend not to at times. And then, okay, let's see if I can find that creature guy. Because this kind of sums up some of the flavor of things that Mordekainen was saying. And I know I saw it last night while I was looking through here. Okay, so I can't find the one that I'm looking for specifically that I liked. I should have marked it with a page number last night, but I didn't. So we'll just go here and show you what some of these these different ones do to give you the flavor. So this is Mordekainen's pen. Some children have imaginary friends that their parents can't see. Sometimes those invisible friends aren't imaginary. And there you go. Uh, so they're not necessarily things that add a lot to the book, but they add a lot of flavor to how Mordekainen sees what's going on around him. Um, and it gives you as a GM some extra storyline material possibly. So Mordekainen's Tome of Foes. And I will be right back with my final thoughts. So Mordekainen's Tome of Foes is for both players and DMs. And I think that uh, it leans more towards the DMs so the split would be something like 40-60. And I say that because the five chapters of lore are really good. Uh, they really give a lot of meat to player characters. Now, for me, I wish that there was more meat in the sense that there was some new tidbits of history. Um, I mean, there are new tidbits of history in here. But, I mean, something a little bit more meaty like maps of the conflicts or things like that. That I've never seen before and that Dungeons & Dragons really hasn't delved into or... I've overlooked it because the histories and the lores that are in this book are spread out against many different articles or books throughout all of Dungeons & Dragons history. With that said, uh, when you move into the, the bestiary, you, uh, there's some stuff that is, has been reprinted, as I mentioned before. And that doesn't really bother me because, it, again, it comes down to fitting this book and giving this book flavor, which goes to support one of the coolest things I think about this book. Uh, when I first started reading the little insert things of Mordenkainen's thoughts that were put in there by Bigby, I was like, this is silly. But by the time I was done with the book, I'm like, man, I'm really glad that they did what they did with Mordenkainen through Bigby and gave him a personality because I remember way back when in the Dungeon Master's Guide for AD&D, that it was just Big B's magic hand, and you really had no idea who Big B was. And now they're taking this in fifth edition, and they're bridging that gap all the way back to first edition players, and they're bringing them back into the game. I think that is stellar. Like I said, I wish there was a little bit more on the lore side, but other than that, um, it's really good. Now, from a GM's perspective or a Dungeon Master's perspective, uh, it does focus a little bit more on higher level campaigns, I don't have a problem with that at all because there's enough meat and stuff for a GM to run specifically a Durger campaign or an Elvish campaign or a Gith campaign that there's a lot of stuff in this book for all levels of play. And I already mentioned my favorite part of the book is that they made an iconic 
image, Morton Cunningham, into a personality in this book by really bringing forth his notes and balance. And you get to see his perspective from inside his box and not outside looking at it from a reader or a player. 